You're watching HuffPost Live, I'm Ricky Camilleri. Before You Know It is a documentary film that follows the lives of people dealing with some of the struggles of getting older, from retirement homes to health and the stakes being raised on serious relationships. Life seems to be getting more complicated as they age, and maybe even more complicated by the fact that these men are gay. Gay elderly men are not, it's not uh, something that you really see in the media too much, and we're thrilled to have some of the participants and the director here to join us. Dennis Kramer is a retired biologist, Ty Martin is a community liaison at SAGE in Harlem. PJ Raval is a filmmaker and director of Before You Know It. And the oldest of them all is Mitchell Williams, a <laughs> mediocre producer here at HuffPost Live. Mediocre. Gee, Lauren Leeds put that in there. Mediocre. Yeah, mediocre Jesus. producer. You got bit today, man. Oh, God. <laughs> so, PJ, tell me a little bit about the film. Where did you get this idea, and how did you find your participants? Um, I got the idea of this film um, back in 2008, actually. I just happened to be at a reception for a previous film that I made called Trinidad, where there just happened to be a large population of gay seniors attending. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was the first time that I was actually in an environment where I saw them as a, as a large number and as a very uh, visible community. Mm -hmm. So that kind of stuck, at, you know, stuck around with me. Um, and around the same time, I was volunteering for an organization teaching uh, queer youth filmmaking. And some of them were as young as 14. So somewhere between thinking about the 14-year-old kids and all the way to the 74-year-olds that I just met um, and realizing they're part of the same community, I just was really fascinated with thinking about whether or not the younger generation is even aware of this older generation um, and why aren't we seeing anything about uh, this generation. Well, it's interesting. We have a lot of segments here about gay representation in media and a lot of it, that, a lot that comes up is that people feel like only young gay white men are represented in, in most of media. So it's interesting because your film, it doesn't just, ex it, it explores people from all different cultures in terms of the, the elderly uh, gay community. Is elderly the appropriate term here or should I say, I say senior, senior citizen? I say senior Senior, okay, thank you. But I mean, I, and one of the things about this particular group is that I, you know, if when I think about it, they've seen such a large amount of change in their lifetime, and so that was that was definitely something that um, intrigued me, mm -hmm. especially you know, being born uh, pre-civil rights, you know, all the way now to uh, gay marriage passing in New York, things like yeah. that. It's a, a lot of change. Mm -hmm. And Dennis, you just celebrated your 80th birthday. Uh, yes, just a couple of days ago. Happy birthday. Well, thank you very much. Of course, of course. And so you celebrated your 80th birthday. You were in the closet for years. Uh, that's correct. And, you know, why come out in, in film? You're so comfortable with yourself now. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think quite a bit I am. Uh, I'm sort of intimidated by all the uh, uh, electronics and everything. All the lights and the cameras? <laughs> yeah. So you, you came out and, you know, what's, what, what, when did you come out in your personal life? Oh, I guess something like uh, 15 years ago. 15 years ago. And this was after, and it's, it's chronicled in the film, um, but it was, it was after the, the passing of your wife, right? That's right, yeah. Wow. Uh, prior to that, I, uh, I kept on the straight and narrow, more or less. Mm -hmm. Uh, when uh, she passed away, I sort of uh, felt it as uh, a complete loss. Yeah. Wow. We have a clip of you in the film that, that I want to I want to show right now. Let's show a clip of Dennis from the film. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, D. D. I'm Candy. Well, nice to meet you. Well, they say candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. Yes. What made you come out? Oh, well, I'm uh, I'm out here, but I'm not out back in Florida where my main residence is. Mm. You're, the only time you come out as a lady is here. At well, home? at Rainbow Vista, you know, it's a gay retirement home. Mm -hmm. We sometimes dress, yeah. What is Michelle, so Michelle you're allowed to dress up in your retirement home? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I like your shoes. Huh? I like your shoes. Oh, thank you, hon. Yeah. Oh, it's nice to be out here with you young people. Now, Dennis, when you were married, did you, did you experiment with dressing up at all? Well, perhaps I might have put on my wife's panties when she went to bingo, but other than that, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but she, so, and she had no idea? Uh, no. Wow, that's unbelievable. Is there anybody else from, from your old life that may be learning about your, your new life for the first time from this movie? Uh, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
was it hard, 15 years ago when, when you came out, was that hard for you? Uh, yeah, it was a gradual process. It wasn't something that happened all at once. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's hard to describe. Yeah. Ty, you've been out most of your life. You've lived in New York for so long. You've seen, I mean, the gay, the, the, the gay community in New York has changed and evolved so much over the years. I mean, at, at this point now, at your age, how do, you, how, do, how do you feel in the gay community now in New York? How do you see the evolution for, with gay marriage, post-AIDS? Wow. It's a huge question. Like, we're, you know, actually, Ty, you know what, Ty, Ty I'm going to get out of here. You just unravel this yourself, and, and I'll come back when oh it's time to wrap up. Oh, my God. That's, uh, firstly, I've, I've been out forever. It seems like forever, um, and it just occurred to me that I'm, I'm going to be 65, so it's like... When? When? October. Oh, okay. So, actually, I'm already 65. I'm going to be 66. <laughs> and I, I don't remember when, what happened, you know, I was just coming out, you know, and now it's like 50 years later and it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. So um, just, just being able to um, witness life from a different perspective is like unbelievable, to say the least. Um, what, what perspective do you, do you mean? Well, growing up in New York, Firstly, I'm a native New Yorker, um, a Harlem Knight. So this is my, my town, my history. And we, we just didn't have these conversations um, about being gay. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of learned how to be invisible, you know. So long as we didn't act a certain way, people kind of understood where we were coming from. So it was like down low. Right. We're talking about we had down low. 40 years ago, so it's not a new revolution. However, um, people seem to have been more friendly back then. Um, I'd, I'd never really had any major problems with people like being harassed or beat or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with if people like you, they like you. So, it, you know, that wasn't a major factor for me. Mm -hmm. Are you are are you amazed that you know at this point in time we're seeing gay marriage passed in so many states and that uh, gays are allowed to be in the military? Did you ever think 40 years ago that y there would be you would be on the front lines of a lot of these of a lot of these social battles for for uh, gay rights? No, I never. I please. 40 years ago, it, it was about having fun. You know, it was about enjoying life. And I was I was fortunate enough to have mentors when I was growing up. Mm -hmm guys who showed me the ropes, you know, as, as far as what to do, what not to do. So there was a network of, of people. Mm -hmm. um, Can you expand on the what to do, what not to do a little bit? Oh, we had things like you never pick up more than one guy, you never do this, you know, safety in numbers, all sorts of tidbits that you kind of learn, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I was kind of um, hardwired to believe that it was natural for me to, to meet a guy who wanted the same things that I wanted, which was basically to enjoy each other, to be supportive. And um, I didn't think that we, we could get married, but I knew that we could live like a couple, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, of course. So, Did you ever think that you, that you wanted to get married or, you know, because something that is explored a little bit in the movie is that, you know, you and your, uh, you and your boyfriend are thinking you know, it, this, the fact that gay marriage is, 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 is being passed, it's creating a little bit of a tension between the two of you, it seems. A little tension? <laughs> I don't want to, look, no, no spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> for, your, for your relationship and for the movie. <laughs> well, actually he's watching, so I need to. <laughs> uh, the bottom line is that uh, we, we do have a, a very significant relationship. I, it never occurred to me that we would get married until very recently, you know? Mm -hmm. And as a result of this, this movie, I forgot that that was a priority for me, to want that type of lifestyle. But you know how you kind of put it on the back burner? Yeah. You know, you just make do. But that's my question. It, was it a priority to, to you before it seemed like it could be a priority? I, I was never one of those guys who would just just out for sex. Mm -hmm. I, whenever I dated someone, it was always about 
a significant relationship. Of course, I yeah. really thought that this person would, we would, we would, mm -hmm. it would be the, the, uh, the last person, mm -hmm. you know, my final love, mm -hmm. forever kind of scenario. So there was a sense of commitment, a sense of relationship, yeah. always. If I didn't think that it wasn't going to be a significant relationship, mm -hmm. I just, that wasn't my focus. Mm -hmm. I wasn't one of those yeah, no, I wasn't. I wasn't curious no, I mean, if you were you know, promiscuous in your day. I, I, yeah. I just, I mean, even within the, even within a committed relationship, if it was something that you can, it'd be great if we could get married one day. Did that thought cross your mind, or was Never. it not? Yeah, Never. that's what I'm curious about. It, it's only recently that I began to accept the fact that marriage is not necessarily between a man and a woman. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like you kind of get it one day, like. Who says that same-sex marriage should not exist? Did, yeah. So, but this is new stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe five years ago, if someone had just said something like same-sex marriage, I would have thought, no, that's that's not how it works because, you know, people always said that marriage is between a man and a woman. So, right. duh. So <laughs> the language has changed. Reality has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, I could make. It's it's what it is that. Our culture is changing now. Yeah, and we have Mitchell here, who is. Uh, <laughs> That's me. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, one of the, one of the things that he said that reminds me of the conversation we were having yesterday, Mitchell, is that 40 years ago it was about going out and having fun, and we were talking about that sort of n the nostalgia for being underground that that you said a lot of people have. Sure. So, um, you know, I mean, I think that when younger gays go to bars now, and we see, you know, especially like in the East Village where those spots have kind of stood for years. We see images of, you know, adult magazines from the, like the 80s and the 90s pasted up against the wall, and these bars kind of have that, that feeling that they've existed. And so I think a lot of younger gays like yearn for the time that you lived in because there's something to be said that if it was underground, it was better. I mean, do you, do you feel like you hear that a lot? I'm not sure if I understand the question. So, so basically, there are a lot of there's a lot of gays now who are you know in their 20s and early 30s, and it's kind of that mentality that you know back in the day it was better. You know, like when everything was underground, it was better. So when you see how gays act now and you compare it to maybe what you experienced in you know the 90s and the 80s and just kind of coming up like when when gay wasn't discussed. Do you feel like there's something that we should have yearned for when it was underground? Do you feel like there, that there was an advantage in gay being underground? Um, I don't think so because for me, it, 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 it was really a matter of um, you, could, you, could, you could get hurt if people sure. thought it wasn't fun, to be quite honest with you. We were able to, to network and have places where we could meet, but I can remember at, as a teenager, back in the uh, 60s, if we were at a party, the police could come in and arrest everybody. So, you know, I don't know about underground stuff, but it was not that fun. Well, and another thing that you said to me, or that you said recently, just in the last five minutes, that kind of stuck out to me, is that you said 40 years ago, um, people were nicer. You know, so, uh, do you think that, like, you're, we're hearing, We've heard more of the harassment cases, you know, prob most recently in New York, but I mean, we've heard them for years. Do you think that because gay is becoming so mainstream that people aren't nice about it anymore because, you know, they're, they just know about it now? You know, before when people are nicer, it may have been because they just didn't know or didn't think about it, but now that gay is like in the media, do you think that that's, the harassment is on the rise because of that? Uh, yes. And the reason, actually, when I said nicer 20 years ago, 40 years ago, that's because I was nicer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, right? you know, it was about, you know, just don't hurt me, you know, I, whatever. You know, I just wanted to just not make any waves. So, of course, everybody was very kind to me. It's cause I was a nice, I'm still a nice person, you know, so I was not a threat. So today, you know, people, I get it. I get the resistance. I see our younger people. They're literally out there having a wonderful time. They're proud. They don't, they're proud to be who they are. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh God, if I, had, if I had had that type of freedom 40 years ago, wow, that would have been just amazing. So there are some, some pros and cons with what it was like 
40 years ago and what it's like today. Um, I'm just, when I'm living in Harlem, case in point, I see a lot of our younger people, they, they're walking down the street. You would think they were in Chelsea, the old Chelsea before Chelsea became whatever, <laughs> on Chelsea. But you know, that type of scenarios are going on. And yet and still, I feel for them because I know that a lot of people aren't embracing them, them on that level. PJ, I'm kind of curious, what lessons were you looking to learn from, from the older gays going into making this documentary? And what lessons did you end up learning? Was it what you thought you were gonna learn or did you learn something different? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think in the process of making this documentary, what I've learned is that um, I think there's, I have a lot in common with them. I think we all have a lot in common um, with the senior population. I think a lot of it is because that self-discovery process, that getting to know who you are um, and uh, kind of adapting with the changing times is always happening. Yeah. So for me, it's been really exciting to think about. Like actually, in the film, Ty has this really great line where he says, um, gay marriage is like saying an iPod in the 70s. Oh, right. Like that idea of you don't even have that concept yet. So for me, what's really exciting is thinking about what is that concept? I don't know. I don't know what that's gonna be when I'm 70, what that is that I can't even think about now, if that yeah. makes any sense. Like maybe it's people living on Mars, I don't know. You know, and maybe it's, who knows? Yeah. Um, but there's something really exciting about that. Mm -hmm. Dennis. You, you know, when you look back on your life and you were married for so long and it, you weren't able to come out or sort of maybe realize your true self until after your wife passed away, do you look back with regret at all? Uh, regret uh, at not having come out sooner or, uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, while I was married, of course, uh, that was not a, a real option. Sure. And uh, I was married uh, 30 years, quite a long time. Uh, no, I, I, I can't say I, uh, we, my wife and I had a very good relationship mm -hmm. and uh, all that time I uh, suppressed. Uh, but you, you knew it was there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I kept it suppressed. And she never, she never suspected anything? I don't think so. I don't wow. believe she did. Wow. You're very secretive. <laughs> <laughs> we have a clip from the, another clip from the movie that I, that I want to play before we continue the conversation. Can we take a look? How many, uh, how many people here live, live alone? Yeah, most people. Right. Yeah. And is that by preference or you just can't we, find anybody? Preference. Oh, oh, when no. I was younger, I always wanted my boyfriends to live with me. But now I don't care. You, if, if I ever get another one, you have your pistol, well. I'll have mine. Because <laughs> I, I, I just don't want to be bothered, you know, like that anymore. I know that today, a friend is far more important than any imaginary lover or wannabe knight in charming armor. I feel very blessed to have a significant other. You know, I've had many friends who died alone and there was no one there to witness it until after the fact. I try not to wonder what would happen with my life if Stanton expires five minutes from now. Wow, Ty, so, you know, as a gay man in the late 70s and the early to mid 80s, and even up into the mid 90s, up until now, really, <laughs> in the last couple of years, <laughs> so I just expand that time frame a little bit. Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you look back, and as you're saying in there, you have friends that, that passed away. I mean, it was, to a, it was a plague that was going on in the 80s. Like, you know, do you feel lucky? What's it like to you to feel like, you know, AIDS is, is maybe not as, as, as um, isn't taking as many lives as it used to? Well, I, I was actually... I ask you the big questions. The, the big <laughs> question, people are still dying. Yes. <laughs> people are still dying alone. Uh, one of, and one of my, my closest friends died last year. Wow. And we didn't find out about it until someone stopped by his apartment and the doorman said, oh, he died a couple of weeks ago. And so to get that type of information, it's like, oh God, what do you do with that? How do you process it? And yet, and still, I remembered having conversations with this man mm -hmm. about what we thought we would do, you know, at, at, at a certain point. And yet, and still, it happened to him mm -hmm. just like that. Mm -hmm. So 
it's a reality. Yeah. What's really great about um, working at SAGE and working with other seniors is that we can process things and we can have real conversations about what's important today. Yeah. And many, many of my constituents literally embrace the now. So mm -hmm. it's like... PJ Mitchell, I'm curious if AIDS is such, a, is such a large part of your social life now, as much as it seems like it was for Ty then. Hmm. I mean, I, you know, I feel like when I was a teenager, I definitely heard a lot of it. You know, I grew up in the time period of the awareness of safe sex. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm hearing as many younger people maybe talking about it as much. It doesn't mean it's not there. Mm -hmm. I would love, I would love to think that it's being taught in schools and, and programs, but I'm sure there's still, you know, there's still a lot of awareness that can happen. Mm-hmm. Mitchell? Um, <laughs> Well, I think that uh, when it comes to safe sex, I think that because of everything that happened in the 80s and the 90s, now it's just kind of this unspoken thing that everyone always uses condoms, or it has been for, you know, for a while. And now what we're seeing is like a complete loop around where it's an unspoken thing that you're using condoms to the point where people aren't using it, because using them anymore, because the interaction that we're having and the conversation that's coming up is, oh, HIV and AIDS isn't what it used to be. It's not what it used to be. And so, you know, I think that people say that they're using condoms, but they're not. Um, I think that, you know, there are other, like, methods that maybe people have devised in their head that makes them feel comfortable about safe sex, which is, it's really, you know, unfortunate because of everything that did happen in the 80s and 90s you know, you would assume that that would still linger on. But the main, the main thing that's coming up in conversations now is, you know, HIV just isn't what it used to be. And it's, and it's more of like, I hate to say this because of, you know, everything that surrounds that word, but they say that it's like the gay diabetes. So, you know, you can live with it for a really Who long... Who says that? <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard Who that. Who says that? I've heard that slang before. It's like the gay <laughs> diabetes. So, you know, you can live a long life with it. And we're just so disconnected. We remember seeing those images maybe when we were younger, but in our, in our lives now when we're actually interacting and having sex with other men, we're just so disconnected from that. Ty, having, again, lived through the AIDS epidemic, and do you, do you ever worry that listening to someone like Mitchell, not to make Mitchell the example right here, that's what we brought you here, Mitchell. I know, make, I know. To make you a bad <laughs> like, example. Uh, but do you, ever, <laughs> do you ever worry that young gays are taking, are, 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 are taking their lives um, to, they're taking their freedom for granted, considering all the activism and, and, all, and, and all the surviving that went into the community in the 80s and the 90s, and now? Uh, yes, I worry, I'm concerned, and if you look at our statistics, you'll see that a lot of young people are becoming infected, not to mention the older people also. But when we, when we start looking at choices, why people do what they do, most people lie about safe sex. I know this for a fact because I, this, this is what I used to do before I worked at Sage. It was targeting, um, I was doing outreach to high risk populations. And, and for the most part, when we start talking about sexual encounters, if you don't have protection within arm's distance, yeah. you're not going to get up and get it. So, you know, this is a reality uh. kind of stuff. And then a lot of people think that what's the big deal? If I become infected, I can just go get some, some medication and live happily ever after. Little do they know that, that it requires a lot, a lot of work, you know. It's more to it than just popping a pill. And how do you know it's gonna work for you, that pill? Mm -hmm. So, last but not least, a lot of, our society thinks that young people think that, that they can get away with anything and it's okay. Mm -hmm. So, it's a lot of learning that yeah. has to be done out there. Of course, Mitchell, did you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Um, I heard you go, eh. I know, well, I don't know if I necessarily agree with, uh, you know, the condoms not being in arm's reach, so people just say no, because I think that, you know, as a young person, I am constantly inundated with condoms. Like, I mean, I walk into a TGI Fridays and they, th they throw them at me, you know? They're like, it's just, it's so mainstream that they just hand them out at all the gay bars. So I don't, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I mean, I, I think that I do agree with the idea that, you know, younger people do think that they may be able to get away with everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I may be crucified for saying that out loud, but I think it's true. I don't think, but, that's, I don't think that's necessarily specific to the gay community. No. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I, I am personally immortal, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I think that the second point you made was probably like the one where you know we just it's we we're so disconnected from it. You know what I'm saying? We just we don't think we think that we can live with it, and we think that it's not a big deal. I think right. that's yeah. that's the conversation that I'm witnessing, like in in people, just the interactions I have with people who are positive that, you know, that do want to have sex with me and then they say, you know, well, it's not what it used to be, you know, it's fine, and then the conversation that people are having about it, you know, you can live with it for a while and it's okay, so. I want to take a comment here to, to, to Dennis. Um, one of our commenters, uh, gay dude, <laughs> says, uh, I want to live in a gay old folks home, but there has to be a disco. Dennis, <laughs> is there is there a disco at Rainbow Vista? Uh, unfortunately, no. Ah, uh, ah. But, uh, but uh, there are plenty of uh, discos in Portland, however. Yeah. What do you do at Rainbow Vista for fun? Well, we go out uh, for lunch, for instance, and uh, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, a gym with uh, weight equipment, and we just bought a new treadmill there. Mm -hmm. And I have a garden, so. Oh, that's nice. It occupies a lot of my time. Yeah. Trying to keep the uh, weeds down. Would you feel more comfortable, is, is dressing up as a woman a nighttime thing for you? Would you feel com more comfortable dressed as a woman here, or would you feel more comfortable dressed the way that you are? Uh, actually, I feel quite comfortable when I'm dressed. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, in certain areas, of course, like mm -hmm. uh, and where I used to live in Florida. I was uh, rather intolerant of yeah. such activities. Yeah, of course. So, PJ, what's next for the documentary? Um, well, we are screening at the Lincoln Center, actually, on uh, Sunday at 5 o'clock at the Walter Reed Theater. Um, awesome. And then from there, we're going to the Edinburgh Film Festival. Um, we'll be in Los Angeles in July, so we're just doing a little bit of a festival tour and hopefully start doing some community screenings. Are you guys going to be going? Yes. That's fantastic. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. And Mitchell, before we leave, tell me a little bit about next week, HuffPost Live's Gay Pride Week. So um, next week, HuffPost Live is celebrating gay pride. We're going to have two segments, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, that uh, covers you know issues that are going on in the LGBTQ community. Um, so you should check that out. Uh, we'll have some drag queens on. We'll have some celebrities on. And uh, we'll also be touching on the, like, the really deep issues that um, kind of you know, each community is dealing with in itself. So that should be good. Well, guys, thank you so much for, for joining us and having this conversation and sharing the documentary with Dennis. Thank you so much for coming in. You guys, you're watching HuffPost Live. There's a lot more coming up next. Coming from Los Angeles, California, I'm Ricky Camilleri. This is HuffPost Live.